Welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott, and we are back in the office. It's been a long time since we've been here to record uh, a podcast, but if you if you forgot, that's my basement. Uh, and we're excited. We got a guest that, that joined us here, and a man that is on the road often. So we're joined by Andrew Wasson of Brush Creek, who is the managing director. And and I'll tell you this, he's constantly on the road. So Andrew, it's been a long time coming. We've been trying to get this podcast, I think, since July of 2022. That's about right. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So, so uh, Andrew, thanks for for making time while you're while you're in town uh, to to join us this evening. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for uh, for having me in. It's uh, it's great to be here with you and finally catch up and uh, get a chance to share the the, the whiskey and, and the stories behind them. So yeah, looking forward to it. It's been great. I've actually kept most of these bottles sealed uh, up until tonight. Uh, we did open the Railroad Dry, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and, and Scott actually, funny enough, just drank it a couple nights ago and was like, oh, it's pretty good. Just yesterday. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I looked at the calendar and realized, Brush Creek. Yeah. Oh, I think I've got a bottle sitting around. <laughs> Yeah. So it's good. It's always better to do these in person where we can actually like, you know, get to know you a little bit prior to and and enjoy the whiskey. And I think the story is going to unfold really, really uniquely here. Um, But funny enough, you didn't get to to be a part of this because Andrew is a world traveler or West Coast traveler. He accepted the invitation in some other time zone and he was here at 530. And I'm like, ah, I'm feeding my child like pizza and salad. I'm like, "Ah, I can't help you right now, bro. Oh, I hate the... uh calendar feature. I, I think that's what happens when you start to populate your calendar in between time zones and uh, only to realize it upon arrival. But I would much rather be early than late. So I, I as I mentioned, I've got a laptop and no shortage of work. So um, <laughs> a little dinner, a little laptop, uh, jockeying and all's well. Uh, yeah, no, we're, we're glad that you're here and we're glad that all, all worked out. But I think before we dive into this, I think it's important that people understand just your background. Um, you know, a lot of times we get in right to the story on Brush Creek and that's good because I do have a leading question for that. But, you know, you're not just a veteran to whiskey production, but you're a dis- distribution expert on on that side. So can you just talk a little bit about how you got into whiskey um, and how you've seen it grow over the last 20 years? Yeah, without a doubt. So I was actually on the distributor side of the business for a little over 18 years. Um, I started with Republic National Distributing Company here in Kentucky and uh, really kind of worked all facets of the the distributor side. So I was an on-premise sales rep. I went into operations. I went into off-premise as a DM. I went into um, an area manager on the DM side and then uh, a marketing manager. And then that was kind of later split between um, uh, finance and uh, the the portfolio management side of things. So I can say that over those 18 years, uh, starting in about 2001, um, we were really on the cusp of really a a whiskey boom. And um, so craft wasn't necessarily a thing at the time. Um, You know, at that point, craft was, um, Brown Foreman and, uh, and Beam and uh, some of the bigger brands, and they were producing some great products. Um, it just, things hadn't opened up to the, the level where we are today. And it's been a wild ride watching um, so many brands develop. It's been, it was, it was tremendous. It was a tremendous opportunity to uh, really be a part of the growth of so many brands. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you saw folks that were, I mean, it was near and dear to their heart. You know, one of the individuals I talked about earlier was Trey Zoller. I worked with Trey for 18 years before I left uh, with this opportunity. And to really see people build brands from the ground up uh, and invest everything they have in them, um, you know, early on, it was very educational, um, took pride in a lot of the, you know, the the growth and the uh, opportunities to be involved. And mm. yeah, it was, it was front and center and it was a wild ride. Yeah. I mean, Scott, think about 2001. You probably could You, I know I couldn't purchase alcohol. You couldn't purchase alcohol in 2001. No. Yeah. I was, I was 16. I think I started just driving then. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, like going into middle school, maybe. But, you know, when you think about it, you know, we, we were joking before. Andrew and I were joking before you showed up. Like people think about like Pappy being hard to find. Like it wasn't but 10 years ago that it was available. Yeah. Not readily, but it was available. It was it was definitely uh 
more available. Yeah. Uh, much more available. And as you and I kind of joked about early on, um, I mean, at that time, you know, early 2000s, it was, you know, Julian uh, was out peddling. You know, yeah. he, he was uh, he was out on the streets and, uh, you know, whether it was making the product during the day or out peddling it in the evening and that sort of thing. And um, it was, yeah, it was more of a push um, than it was a pull at yeah. that point. And um, so it's it's been, I mean, he's one of those individuals that you've seen go from, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other. And, and quite honestly, he's just as equally humbled today as he was, you know, at that point, which is pretty awesome to see. Yeah. I know people probably have a totally different reality of what that looks like based off of just the brand itself. But um, there's a lot of humbleness, you know, with those mm-hmm. individuals that that uh, put a lot of time and energy, you know, into paving the road for for other people. Yeah. To follow. No, I, I think it's super, super true. And it, it's interesting because we just um, went to uh, Stutzel Weller and, you know, they just talked about the humility of that family just in general, like just bootstrapping everything together and, yeah. and working through. And, and I think that's, what's cool about, you know, where you are now, y'all are kind of, well, you have a, a good family behind you all. You're still bootstrapping it in a way because whiskey ain't cheap. It's not cheap. And, um, you know, one of the things we kind of jokingly discussed is, you know, where we're located in Saratoga, Wyoming, which is South Central Wyoming, uh, it's probably not the most efficient place to do business, <laughs> but it, it is one of the most uh, inspiring. But w- with that also comes a lot of hard work in terms of uh, you're not front and center in terms of a large group of people like you would be in Louisville or a metropolitan area. So uh, there's there's a lot of uh, digging in and uh, marketing and grassroots campaigns to, to get the word out. And, uh, but we're having fun. Yeah. And as I said, it's a, it's a beautiful part of the country. And, um, you know, the West is, is it's, uh, obviously it's, it's taken hold, uh, and everybody wants to be, you know, Rip and Beth and you know everything else that's going on out there right now, and so it's uh, that, that's. I don't know that many people want to be Beth, but uh. you know, maybe not Beth. But uh, there's uh, there's so many people are kind of fascinated uh, about that part of the country, mm-hmm. and uh, it really is. It's it's the Wild West, and it's still it's an area that's a lot of unknowns, uh, un- unbelievable natural landscape, and just uh, curiosity. So it's a fun place to be. Um, and we're having a fun time in Bone Brands. Yeah, no, I think it's super interesting. And, you know, we were sitting at, at lunch a couple weeks ago with another brand and I looked up and I'm like, Scott, we got Brush Creek coming. And I'm like, that on the shelf, on the shelf, there's, there's Brush Creek. And then on the menu, there was Brush Creek, like a sandwich. And first thing I asked Andrew, I'm like, so how is this all connected? And so mm. you missed this story. So I think it's really interesting. So a lot I'm of people, we're all getting this story, me and the listeners at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, I think what's interesting is a very popular hotel. And just as today, I read on um, Louisville Today uh, that Hotel Distill was named a four, four Diamond Hotel by AAA, which is, you know, congratulations to the team. That's a that's a big deal. Um, one of only eight places in the city to get that, that Vincenzo's and a couple other um, places. But Hotel Distill actually has a, a little bit of a place in heart with the, the, the restaurant repeal there. So for, for everyone listening who's may have stopped into that great restaurant um, right there on Whiskey Row, how was there a connection between Brush Creek and Repeal? Yeah, well, I really had to kind of put that together when I was interviewing with the group uh, a little over three and a half years ago. So um, I was informed about the opportunity from somebody here in the industry and um, flew out there. Um, it's a... Um, the distillery is located on a 30,000 acre working cattle ranch that also happens to house what's considered the the, the number one luxury resort in the American West and uh, just just showstopper, uh, beautiful. But as I was interviewing, um, the, the group of principals that I was talking to said, you know, what are the chances of, you know, turning a distillery out here, uh, making it profitable? And I honestly looked around and I said, it's very little. I'm like, we're in the middle of nowhere. And, um, you know, it, it's inspiring, but we're in the middle of nowhere. And so as I started to do more research about uh, what was surrounding me, I, I found out that the the ranch itself was owned um, by a family uh, that owns White Lodging. Uh, White Lodging is, uh, they were considered one of the number one uh, largest Marriott franchisees in the country. And uh, so 
that was in addition to all their kind of hotels around the country. Um, this was really the place where the family had purchased uh, and wanted to, to kind of create a retirement location. Uh, and like so many other things that they had done over the course of their history, they took um, a, not a, a small ranch, a large ranch, but with not a lot of kind of uh, buildings and an outpost and turned it into what's considered the number one luxury resort in the American West. Um, there's a series of lodging properties over the, the 30,000 acres. Uh, but one of the latest developments was what was considered uh, the farm at Brush Creek. Uh, the farm at Brush Creek is uh, it's about a $40 million Epicurean experience. When I talk about an Epicurean experience, uh, there, there's no lodging on the property, but um, it it happens to house um, a award-winning restaurant uh, called the Cheyenne Club, the original chef was with the French Laundry. There's a 96-yard underground tunnel that happens to have a little over 30,000 bottles of wine in the cellar collection. There's hidden speakeasies. There's greenhouses. There's chef programs, uh, creameries and chef programs, creameries and uh, bakery programs. And all of this existed. Uh, the one thing that uh, they wanted to have on site that was not within their reach was a distillery in a brewery. Um, and part of that was because this group had outlets themselves around the country through white lodging. So uh, as part of that, they uh, they reached out. They got a couple of investors involved and um, they said, OK, let's move forward. And so that's kind of where I came in, learning more about the uh, the background of the hotel properties uh, in the ranch itself. I thought, well, this isn't the most efficient place, but when you have all of this surrounding you, Plus, uh, you have an award-winning collection of properties on site uh, and across the country. There's a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're able to do is create a, um, uh, a trademark licensing agreement to be able to utilize the name Brush Creek. And uh, they had spent a lot of money, uh, both uh, domestically and internationally, building a brand. And so, look, they, they had already gone down that roadway and it was a lot easier mm -hmm. to, uh, to be able to associate Brush Creek with a product than uh, to start from scratch. And then uh, we were able to create some strategic uh, partner programs with the hotels and markets. And uh, in this business, a lot of brand building is liquid to lips. And if you can uh, put product into the hands of uh, hands in the mouths of, of folks out there uh, across the country, it's a great brand building opportunity. And so that's where I saw some of the, um, the, the path to development for this program. And we've been able to kind of move forward with it. It's been, yeah, very advantageous for, again, a program in the middle of uh, South Central Wyoming. And they do American Wagyu, not Japanese. America. Uh, is that where they massage the cows? Yeah. I haven't officially seen anybody massaging cows, but it is some pretty darn good beef. It, I hear they live a good life until it's over. <laughs> uh, it's don't life. we all? That's a good point. I, I feel like I live a pretty good life and one day it'll be over. <laughs> That's the hope. Yeah. The hope is that my son gets a nice insurance policy when I die. <laughs> that tomahawk um, yeah. is uh, it's something to write home about. There you go. You know, the, this is completely off topic, but we talked about beef. You know, I gotta right, go here we go. We gotta, gotta, gotta go talk about food. <laughs> you know what the most advantageous thing to do is? Is to go buy an animal that is slaughtered. If you can get oh, a, yeah. a stock your stock your freezer. Yeah. yeah. Did but that last year. It, it It's amazing. I mean, we just did it. And like having your own third of a cow, like that goes a long way, long way. And yeah. then you barter with the people you buy the cow with. So like, I don't eat brisket. So I like, I bartered like this 20 pound piece of brisket for like right. three ribeyes. So like we, we, you know, trade, trade evenly for the things you want to eat. Uh, and my in-laws didn't end up getting ground beef. So they split that between me and my brother-in-law. And so we got 66 pounds of ground beef. I got ground beef for at least a year and a half. Yeah. It's a lot of ground beef. It is. You can get pretty creative with that, I'm sure. I, I can. I'm, I'm trying to. But, like, this is just a pro tip. Yeah. Find out where you can get a pig, a cow. I don't, you, chicken is chicken. You know, I don't really want to. <laughs> Having your own eggs is a, is a benefit. Uh, nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just at the groceries. 18 was, like, eight or nine bucks. Yeah. Yeah, raising chickens is a pain in the ass, though. Yeah, I don't want that. My Especially son wants on a small scale. On a small scale, it's a pain in the ass. Large scale, it's all Jameson wants to do is chase those things around. Like he was at a farm last week. My son was. He's three years old. All he wanted to do is chase him around, and pick him up. 
I'm never in one place for long enough to actually buy a carton of eggs, uh, but I'm going to take your. Uh, He's going on. Can I, can I get a three pack of eggs? Can I just get a quarter dozen, please? Oh so, my God. It's you, more like an egg McMuffin at McDonald's. There you go. You know, yeah. uh, the you're, you're not you're not staying at the residence inn with the like. You bring your own pots and pans. It's, no, it's not happening. Not happening. Uh, you know, at least at a Marriott property. There so, you go. so this Brush Creek property. I mean, it sounds pretty impressive. It sounds like it's it's a draw to the area. I mean, that's what the draw is. It is. You know, it's a um, it's a it's a little bit more than just a draw. Well, it's a draw to the area from folks all over the world. And um, I've met, I've had an opportunity to meet just some really unique individuals uh, over the course of three and a half years. And um, some of them are folks that um, are probably really well known. And then others are some of those individuals, some of the most interesting people that I've met out there are folks that fly under the radar only to learn, you know, what that title or position is. And you're like, wow, that was just a great conversation yeah. with somebody who's in a really unique position. And um, yeah, and just, it's, it's all walks of life. And uh, it's really, it's, it's a place where people go to get off the grid and, uh, and really just um, so many folks are coming from bigger cities and they haven't had the opportunity, opportunity like a lot of us to jump on the back of a horse or, you know, just be in a remote part of the country. Mm. And, you know, you see they're, they're with their kids. It's the first time they've been on a horse. It's the first time they've been on a razor on a, you know, on a hillside in the mountains. And it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see how that all comes together. And um, just the individuals that, that work at the property, uh, at the height of the season, they can have over 300 employees and there might be 140 guests and 300 employees uh, and talk about being taken care of. They go out of their way and these folks are, they're from all walks of life and they're just, they're there because they really are passionate about the role that they're in. You know, whether that's a, a server, a bartender, a hosp any type of hospitality, um, you, you name it. And it's, so one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves on uh, in being surrounded by all these different talents is they all really, um, they, they are kind of top of their craft. And so you're surrounded by those people and it pushes you every day to, to be inspired and kind of, uh, yeah, uh, elevate your, your program. Mm. I was going to say, I saw some images on uh, your Facebook earlier and it sounds like once you get there, if it snows, you're stuck. So uh, the yeah. accommodations are probably a, a benefit to work in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately I, I don't get to, uh, to live there, uh, but uh, I can tell you the accommodations are great. Uh, again, that's, that's, one of the maybe the the pitfalls of not being you know part of that program we're our separate entity and so um yeah i can say my my housing doesn't look like that <laughs> uh, i have had the opportunity um, from time to time to uh stay on property and it's it's a great experience but um yeah it's the the roads right now as i mentioned you yeah. know, earlier we, we've had an impasse on 80 and i mean there's we haven't been able to get a purchase order out in a week and um now the flip side of that is we will have some, you know, we talk about the, just the maturation program in terms of, you know, our whiskeys and, and whatnot. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, we get some great temperature fluctuations, you know, uh, the further we get into spring and summer. Yeah. And that, that's really been kind of a fun part to, to kind of to follow along as well. We know that we're going to have a little bit more uh, of a maturation process over time than we would if we were in this part of the country. But that's just part of making whiskey in Wyoming. Yeah. Well, and I, so I think what's really interesting is we haven't talked about this. Now you, you, you do have a still and you, you are crafting your own whiskey there, but right now you've gone through a, a, a blending process, right? And, and it's yeah. a, just an exercise in, in, in blending that. And I'm sure your own whiskey will come of age here shortly because you all have been distilling for a little bit now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd be really interested to see what Tennessee whiskey tastes like after it's been aged in Wyoming and Kentucky tastes like by itself, right? We're getting it in a blended experience sure. here tonight. Like, I, I think that's really interesting is you, you can, can you take the Kentucky out of the Kentucky bourbon? That is the question or the Kentucky raw. Well, I'll tell you what we, uh, so kind of touching on that. We say we're, we're craft distillers, craft blenders and craft innovators. Uh, the distilling process is what's happened over the course of three plus years. The, um, the blending side is, is our purchase of barrels out of Kentucky, Indiana, and Tennessee, and in really other areas uh, as we go forward. 
And then the, the innovation is really, you know, trying to do some things that are uh, a little bit more Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory and, and, and push the bounds on what hasn't been done before and, and have some fun based off of, you know, some of the operations surrounding us. But um, I will say that I have put product into the hands of folks, a uh, number of people in the trade, and it's, it's thrown them off a little bit. Uh, there's some, there's some commentary that goes along with different, you know, products in different States and, and different, uh, I guess, uh, suppliers and they don't pick up on it mm. and they'll say, well, I don't, I don't pick that up in, in the taste profile. And I think part of it is when you're aging a 13 year old product, uh, at 8,000 feet elevation over a course of a couple of years, it, it has a tendency to, to change things. And, yeah. uh, I, based on the responses that we're receiving, it's all been positive. Yeah. Well, and, and that was one of the things you said is in the bourbon in particular, that it couldn't be up to 50, some 15 year old maturation in there. Um, and you know, one of the things in my mind with Tennessee, I always look for that banana or mineral note, right? Those come from two very distinct distilleries. We're not going to name names on here. You all should be smart enough by now. Um, but you know, I, I think that's what is really interesting. I don't get either of those, but I get a full flavored spice rack bourbon. Mm, So like, and so now we're going to go talk about the bourbon because I just started talking about it. So this is a 94 um, proof blend, straight bourbon whiskeys, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee. Um, And so your, I would say your flagship, right, would be this straight bourbon whiskey and then the straight rye whiskey. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that is a, um, it's a non-chill filtered 94 proof on both our bourbon and our rye. And, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's on our bourbon a blend of kind of four to up to really 14 to 15 year old product in there now. And our rye is four five and six year old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, with, with bourbon, like, you know, one of the things I think is like, sometimes people just kind of put their nose up to blended whiskeys, but I think barrel craft spirits have done a very good job of kind of like blazing the trail of, yep. especially when you look at all three spirit, like all three kind of coming together. And I think this is, you know, I could look over here at like one of the barrels that I have that is Kentucky and in Tennessee. And there's a reason why it's pretty full. Don't necessarily like it, but I've already gone back to the bourbon twice well, as we sit here. Mm. Um, and I really like this bourbon, like at 94 proof, I think it's got more body than 94 proof. And it's got a full flavor, which I'm really enjoying. And sometimes in that under a hundred, you don't necessarily get the full depth of flavor. And that's my, like my new term after I continue to watch cooking shows is depth of flavor. Um, like this one has a really good depth to it. Yeah. It's like, it's thick. Yeah. Like, like I, I was saying, it's kind of like bready. Yeah. Like it's, it's doughy. It's, it's got a little viscosity to it. Yeah. And I think that comes with the age, right? Like there's the maturity in there that's balanced by the youth of it. And I think that gives it some elasticity. Yeah. And I think we're also finding out, um, as I mentioned before, you know, Steve Nally, it was a good friend in the industry, um, following his 33 years at Maker's Mark. He spent six years at Wyoming Whiskey. Obviously, he's done some great things at, at both those locations and, and continue that on with Bardstown Bourbon Company. And um, he came in pretty early on and, and gave us a lot of insight. Uh, just he still has a home out there and he loves Wyoming. And he was very forthcoming about his experiences and, uh, you know, the, the rights, the wrongs and indifferences. And so... We've, we've followed, you know, um, a lot of his advice and, and others in the industry out in that part of the country. But um, on the on the blending side, uh, our head distiller, uh, Philip Munt, he was head of production at Strain of Hands, which is North America's largest single malt uh, producer. And he's got two international degrees. And, and he's not shy about saying, hey, you know, the blending process is it's kind of front and center um, in a lot of parts of the world, uh, just not necessarily here, uh, in the States. And so he really loves that part. I mean, based off of the size of our program, we will, will always be a distiller, but we'll always be a blender. Yeah. And we kind of say that, you know, distilling, and I don't take it lightly, but distilling is like baking a cake. I mean, you hope that you've got a great recipe and you bake that cake over and over again. Uh, we're on the, the blending side it's an opportunity to really kind of get in there and, and have some fun and try to create something unique uh, based off of uh, a number of bif- different kind of parts and pieces that uh, 
is a great outcome. Yeah. And so I think that's where we are. I think for us, it's, it's a good fit. Um, there's folks that do one or the other, uh, or, or both. And, um, it just, it fits us right this time. Yeah. I have a sneaking suspicion. There might be some American single malt somewhere around uh, Wyoming sometime. Yeah. I, I have a sneaky suspicion about that one as well. Um, and if, and if you're not get on it, um, because we love our American single malt around here and it, it's, I think it's, you can tell the blending in the bourbon is kind of like that American single malt because that bready note, like you're, you're getting the barley to really shine in this. Um, and so I, I think that's a really unique flavor. And so for me, because I, I've started to drink more scotch, more Irish whiskey that is malted barley mainly, like I, I'm starting to pick up on that bready flavor grain a lot more than I used to. Yeah. And like people don't understand, like corn is great. It's going to provide sweetness, but like, it's going to be the other flavoring grains that, that provide you so much more flavor. Don't talk bad about corn. I'm not talking bad about corn. <laughs> not no. talking bad about corn at all. I'm just saying like, you know, that's, that's the fun of it, right? Yeah. I mean, just being able to, to kind of really get in there and, and change things up and, and really showcase the characteristics of each one of the grains involved. And, um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, yeah. it, it's a, it's a fun way to, to kind of spotlight a, a blended program. Mm-hmm. Well, the nice thing too, is like your Wyoming whiskey, you're a Wyoming whiskey. You can do it whatever you want. You don't need to do Kentucky bourbon. You don't need to do Indiana rye, Monongahela rye, oh, Maryland gosh. rye, Indiana oh. rye. You can do a blend of everything. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the the I, being a Kentucky guy, right? And then I, I did go to to school out west. Um, I was drawn to kind of get back out west at some point uh, in my career or life, and uh, this served as the perfect opportunity. But you know, having been on the distributor side in Kentucky for 18 years, you're so super high, hyper focused on everything that's happening in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And it really provided a great opportunity to kind of step outside of your comfort zone and look at what's happening in other parts of the country. Yeah. And look, I mean, I, I, I think Kentucky produces some of the, the, the best bourbon out there, but uh, there are so many things out there. Uh, and the further removed you are, you just, your eyes are kind of open to that. Mm-hmm. And I think it, uh, it, yeah, it, it has an opportunity to help showcase different profiles and programs that are taking place that uh, you wouldn't otherwise maybe know about. I mean, there, there's so many things out there and the further the West you get, it really, it shines through. Yeah. You know? I, I'm still waiting for the the time when we start get regional. Like we do it by state now, but like regionality of of whiskey, right? Because there's similarities between Indiana bourbon and Kentucky bourbon. Similarities. I'm not saying they're the same. Kentucky bourbon's better in Indiana, and it's better in Tennessee. Duh. <laughs> um, just had I have to just clarify that for everyone that's listening to this. But like regionality, right? So you have your like Ohio Valley, you know, bourbons, and then you have your you know, your Midwest or your color, like your Rocky mountain bourbons, right? Colorado's really done a great job of showcasing, you know, what they're all about. There's, I just read the other day, how many distilleries are, are in existence in Colorado. There's a lot of craft distilleries in Colorado. It's, it's pretty crazy. And, and they're all taking an opportunity to showcase, um, a, a lot of the, the grains within their, you know, mm-hmm. their regions and, uh, and spotlight things. And, um, uh, and they're unique. Yeah, there's a there's a pretty vast collection of uh, profiles uh, that are out there amongst just Colorado producers, but in and amongst themselves, they've created a pretty big category. Mm. I think the mountain region would be like my favorite place to go because I've already done Frey Ranch, which is in in Tahoe, right, uh, or basically Tahoe, and then you have what's happening in Wyoming, you have what's happening in in Colorado. It's just a great place to experience whiskey because the altitude's different. You're getting the best rye. You're getting the best best malt because most of these people are brewers at heart, so they know what that's like. Like that's just a difference than like everything be- in Kentucky. No fault of its own because it's becoming such a huge production. It's becoming so chemical oriented. It's losing that like dude with long hair. <laughs> just like he's like I've been brewing beer for thirty years, guys. Well, fun- <laughs> funny enough, you say that there was uh, as we started out um, earlier saying that my, our original distiller came from Laws. He was really kind of um, it, tied to the the rye program with Laws. 
Um, but Philip, uh, who's our, our current head distiller, he was a brewer before uh, he became a distiller. He actually ran one of the largest beer bars in D.C. before he got into the brewing industry. And then that led him back to Colorado, where he was from. And um, and so his, his combination of background on the brewery side, um, as well as we, we've got a couple other uh, uh, individuals that are tied to it, are, yeah, it, they, all, all their backgrounds shine through yeah. in what we're doing, which yeah. is great. No, I, or a I, combination I, of, you know. Yeah, it, and I think that's what's really unique is just be whoever you want to be, right? Like you're on this $40 million playground, basically. <laughs> um, and like, why not create an experience because that's what this whiskey is like. That's that I think gets lost in the conversation is whiskey is an experience. Whiskey is not just something you drink. It's the conversation around whiskey. We get at this all the time, but if we didn't sit here and have a conversation with you and like interrupt ourselves with talks about cows and talks about, right. you know, like the regionality of, of American whiskey, then yeah, that's great. But like, that doesn't get at the heart of why brush Creek exists. And I think that's, what's interesting is like it exists because it's creating an experience for people to want to go out to Saratoga to enjoy, you know, craft craft whiskey at its, at its core. And I think that's, what's interesting. Yeah. We, we are really starting to expand upon it's taken a couple of years, but we're really starting to expand upon our distillery experiences, not only with the guests on the ranch. Uh, we just recently opened up our, our open table platform, but our curated experiences, because you can stand, you know, you can stand in the the front of the distillery overlooking a 30,000 acre, you know, working cattle ranch. And you can look at the snow melt waters that are coming down from the snowy mountain range over your shoulder at 12,000 feet. Uh, we could talk about, you know, the foraging we do from the juniper on site that's part of our gen program or the greenhouse. I mean, there's, there's all these great things that... Uh, like so many other places, but they're unique to where we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you surround yourself, like I said, with a lot of these just uh, such talented craftsmen and, uh, you know, with departments surrounding us. And it's it it pushes the needle every day. And uh, it's it's a great, great way to be inspired. No, I, I think that's super, super great because, again, it's a you want to be able to go to a destination like this. This is a destination. This is a tourist opportunity. Like we've been talking to our wives, I don't know, for the last year about like, how do we get to Wyoming? Like, how do we, how do we get, get there? Obviously not by horse, uh, plane by plane plane. when it's not snowing. Yes. Uh, but apparently that's all times of the year. So, and like when you get to Wyoming, do you go to Colorado first and then drive up or do you fly into Jackson hole, which is stupid expensive and then drive around Wyoming? I'll tell you a great way to do it is if you, the drive between Denver and Saratoga is beautiful. Uh, if you like beer at all, I'm a CSU grad. You stop in Fort Collins, you've got one of the best micro distillery, you know, showcases in Colorado. So you jump in a car, two hours up, uh, you've got somebody driving, you get a chance to uh, stop, have lunch, and experience a plethora of, you know, microbreweries that are all over Fort Collins. You get back in your car, you go through some beautiful landscape as you cross over between Colorado and Wyoming, and then you take uh, Highway 130 over uh, the Snowy Mountain Range, which is, again, a little over 12,000 feet elevation at the top, and you can see forever. And Mm -hmm. then uh, you get to the bottom of it, and you're at our distillery, uh, still at 8,000 feet, and um, it's, uh, it's a pretty unique experience, and that all happens in, you know, they're part of a, an afternoon. All right. What's the best month to come? And then we need to start planning this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it depends on who you are, uh, what you want to do. Uh, if you're out there just looking for the best weather, it's really probably a July, August. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's exactly when everybody else wants to be out there. Um, but, you know, really any time of year. I mean, I, crazy enough, when I come back to Kentucky, I can't seem to warm up. It can be 10 degrees out there and I can be in a long sleeve shirt and just a light jacket and I'm fine. I get back here and the humidity and everything yeah. kind of just cold and cold and wet havoc with you. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of gray, you know, yeah. on the skies. Um, but you know, I mean, you can go out there and, uh, didn't mention it, but there's a 700 acre private ski resort on property as well. And they've got two snow cats for uh, private snow cat skiing. I had a chance to take my team up there for a team building, uh, exercise a couple weeks ago. And, 
not a bad place. Yeah. And um, between that, snowmobiling, uh, a lot of activities, but it really depends on what you're looking for. It's it's all year round, but but if if you're out there for warmer weather, it's, it's going to be July, August, September. Yeah. Well, that won't be 2023. See, you. I don't know, you got, got like a few things on the radar. Four yeah. trips, <laughs> like three or four trips. And- yeah. Baby, baby, yeah. baby, Llewellyn coming September twenty twenty three. So, Congrats. Uh, yeah, thank you. It is it's wild times, uh, and I can I, fi- I finally can share that on the podcast because we've hit the twelve week mark and everything's going good. So there we go. Good to hear. Knock on wood um, that we're 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 going through that. So uh, it, it's it's wild times, um, but it's it's good. You know, I, I think Bourbon is is a place like we do a lot of Kentucky stuff, obviously because we're here, but. I, I want to continue to expand. I want to continue to to get out and, and see the rest of the, the bourbon and whiskey world because there's, there's so much and like America's so young in it. It's not just American whiskey. I want to see, I want to see world whiskey. Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't really touch on it yet, but you know, like the railroad rye, mm-hmm. you know, that was one of the things just as we started the discussion uh, prior to the podcast, um, there is so much history that's steeped in the West that doesn't get told in a classroom anymore. And so this was a project that was, um, personally, it was two plus years. Uh, we had to petition the Union Pacific Railroad three times. Uh, they basically said, you're going to end up with a series of toothpicks and uh, whiskey over a 1,200-mile trail uh, between basically Chicago and Rock Springs, Wyoming. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, we, we had a couple of bungs that popped and that sort of thing, but, um, we had, uh, really just a historic journey. And part of, part of this program is really just telling the history of the West. So I'm going to ask you guys, do you know how the standard time zone came to be? No, no, I don't. Okay. Well, um, so actually when they were able to complete the, um, the transcontinental railroad from coast to coast travel, then people had to be actually arrive at a station on time. Well, every town kind of had their own time zone. So it wasn't a big deal until all of a sudden you had to be at the station at a certain time to pick up the train to go to the, you know, wherever your travels might take you. So that's where the standard time zone came to be. And I mean, it, you can go on and on about the history between um, whether it's Abraham Lincoln and bridge over troubled waters or, you know, whatever it happens to be that just, it's really neat stuff that in our in our eyes we put a QR code on the back. We've got drones, we've got history, and we're doing a lot of just kind of uh, educational pieces that tie into it. That it's kind of like a little bit of history, you know, uh, education and a glass of whiskey, which is fun. Hmm. Um, and yeah, it's kind of that uh, BW3's trivia <laughs> on Monday nights or whatever it might be. So they had it figured out in the 1800s about you know time zones but we're still trying to figure that out with the iphone right yeah and the, and the whole uh calendar yeah cal- three, calendar three yeah, hours yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you know the, the crazy thing is like we need one time zone I, i'm tired of all these time zones just give me one <laughs> just give me one like well a lot of people want to say it goes back to more more of the you know kind of not farmer solvent act but you know basically the the, the farming side of it how much you time know, you got in the day yeah and um but a lot of really cool history and, and that's one of the things like what we've got here tonight is box car number one. Uh, we put 80 barrels of whiskey on a 60 foot side load rail car shipped it down the path, the transcontinental. It was the first time that had happened since pre, uh, uh, prior to prohibition. And, um, it's, it's, it's fun. Everybody really embraced it, uh, in that part of the country. And I think with each box car that we do, it'll be just another way of being able to kind of, share history hmm. uh, with folks um, as they're enjoying uh, just a, a great rye. And we actually chose rye uh, for the simple fact that rye is uh, obviously a little bit more uh, predominant in that part of the country, mm. but it's also a hearty grain and it's yeah. a representative of the people in that part of the country during that time. And so that was not only an homage to the uh, the railroad industry, but to the people and, and really that part of the country, which is, you know, still, Wyoming is the least populated state in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you realize you can go, I mean, we're, we can be two hours to the closest stoplight, depending on which direction you go. You <laughs> know you're in a remote location when you're two hours to the closest stoplight. That's wow. crazy. Uh, I wish I was two hours away from the closest stoplight. <laughs> um, so 
uh, just the stats on this, if you're wanting to find this in Kentucky, there are a few bottles left by the time this podcast comes out. It may or may not be available, but so this is box card number one. This is bottle 3020. Um, it is 52% alcohol or 104. Um, and it again is straight rye whiskey. And, and this is a very tasty rye whiskey. We didn't talk about the, the straight by itself. Scott, you just drank this the other night and you actually warmed your palate up with this. So take it away on, on what you liked about it, because I think this is a rye that fits your profile. Yeah. I was going to say, cause that was, that was my initial impression yesterday or last night when I was, when I was sipping on this, because as most people know, if they've listened to the podcast, I don't like grassy rye. I just don't. I like more of a like traditional sweeter rye. This one has that. It's got the caramel vanilla notes, but it also has like a pop of citrus, which I really, really like. You nailed it. Yep. Um, you know, comparing it to some other rye whiskeys that are like 100% rye or whatever, it's, or it's just mint and herbally and, you know, green tea notes and grassy. I don't prefer that. This was where, you know, I started last night drinking and I was like, okay, well, that's a good benchmark to set because, you know, after I was drinking a couple of bourbons that that hits my profile a lot better. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about this and just knowing Scott, the way I know him, the reason I think he likes this one, it's got some gin notes to it. It's got some like juniper, citrus, lemon type notes. And being a gin drinker, I can understand why you don't like grassy, right? You want those bright acidic notes. Like I like herbally. Yeah. But I like them more in my, in my gins, but yeah. Yeah. The bright citrus notes are yeah. going to pop through. Yeah. And so I think this one has a, a lot of gin characteristics coming out in this one. Yeah. I mean, you, you really kind of nailed the head on, on that. Uh, this was a, a 12 barrel blend that we did out of the, the 80 barrels that we brought out. Uh, 12 barrels went into this and, um, it's a, it's a high rye, um, and, uh, about a 91% rye in there. And again, uh, it's a four or five and six might've been a little bit of seven in there. Um, but it's, it is definitely rye forward. So you're going to pick up on a lot of that kind of white pepper spice in there, but it does touch on some of the citrus notes and, uh, just a good long finish. One of the things we're excited about is as we do boxcar two and three, We've set back product so that we can continue to take some of that product that came out on the original boxcar, put it into the next series and the next series with a little bit more, you know, maturation from those original uh, barrels that we brought out and just kind of see how that inf influences thing and things. And really, each boxcar will be a, uh, a different blend, a different proof, and just a different, you know, unique way to tell the story mm. of the West, yeah. which is fun. And if this sounds like a, a boat that floats around... It may have been run by that person that has a boat that floats around the, the world as they have whiskey. Yeah. Well, as, as you and I talked about earlier, um, Trey was, he was, he was really somebody I looked up to in the industry and, and really it was because he was on the forefront of a lot of things that were happening in terms of innovation and, and kind of pushing the bounds. And he, he wasn't coming from a big background, you know, as a big distiller, he was doing things, um, uh, as an independent and, and really he and his dad. And I mean, he, he stuck his neck out there, and um, I, I think that's uh, more well-known now than it was years ago, but he really kind of led some of that craft movement, and uh, I always appreciated the fact that he was entrepreneurial. Um, I love to travel, and as I've said, I could probably live out of a suitcase um, and be perfectly happy with <laughs> it, but um, I watched him cover just all different parts of the world. Uh, and he got to do it based off of um, the program that he was involved in and by creating experiences and opportunities. And I'm like, that's that's a pretty cool thing to do. So it, it is a little bit of a nod to him um, in addition to obviously the American West. So in addition to their your regular portfolio, you also have a finished portfolio. And I, I think this is brilliant because anyone who doesn't have a finished portfolio or an American single malt aging, you just you're not paying attention to whiskey at all just for every brand that's listening to this if you don't have an american single or if you don't have a finished profile go and do it please for the love of god just do it, it you, you'll benefit 20 times from it but anywho off my soapbox um if you have a, a a great finished profile so the one we're drinking is the honig which is uh in 
in the state of Kentucky now, but you also have um, a Colorado release and you also have a uh, distillery only release, uh, which is the Chimney Rock, which is the distillery only and the Carboy, which is the Colorado only. Did Correct. I get that right? Correct. Okay, yep. good job. I'm make sure I listen. Yep. Um, and so we, we won't be talking about those two because they're, they're a little more limited, but we'll talk about the Cabernet cask finished bourbon. So, you know, when, when you all, again, innovation and, and coming up with something, you know, there's, there's a few Cabernet casks on the market. Why start there? Well, I actually have um, my distributor background was wine and spirits. Mm. And uh, as much as I love selling spirits, I really enjoy drinking wine. Uh, it's one of those things when, you know, the further down the line you get in the business, you spend a lot of time behind a, a, a computer screen, laptop, Excels, formulas, and everything else. And at the end of the day, I really like a great glass of wine uh, or two. And so um, that's that's a little bit about where that nod uh, comes from. Uh, the other side of it is that when you're surrounded by a 30,000 plus uh, seller of wine uh, in a very remote location in Wyoming, it gives you a, another, you know, complete uh, appreciation for wine and, uh, and, and just, just everything that goes into the program. So uh, the, the Honig program that we that was our first initial cask finish series and uh michael honig who is a third generation winemaker in napa uh they probably are on about their 45th 46th uh, vintage release i just had a lot of appreciation for his family and what they were producing their cab and sauv blanc and uh they do it really well and so he's the kind of guy that on the distributor side of the business he would say how early can we start how late can we go and how can we make, you know, uh, the biggest impression in the market during our time together? And so it just had a great work ethic. And uh, actually, this came about like during kind of leading up to COVID. And um, I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, do you know much about Cabernet finished whiskeys? And he said, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> he said, are you wanting to get in the wine business? And I said, no. And uh, he said, do you want me to get in the whiskey business? I said, not really. <laughs> I said, but... I'd like to do a collaboration and um, actually over a phone call uh, it came to be, and that's just kind of showcases good friendships and appreciation for one another's uh, backgrounds, experiences and, uh, and yeah, just industry relations. So yeah. that is um, our Honig. That's our first release. Uh, very limited, a little over a hundred uh, six packs on that. Um, and it is um I think 97.4 proof on that. It's nine months in a French oak cask um, that's, uh, again, matured kind of along Wyoming's elevated frontier. Uh, they're about 8,000 feet, and um, it's a beautiful expression. It um, We were a finalist in uh, Ultimate Experience uh, well, Challenge, uh, 95 points, just a lot of great accolades on that. Getting into it, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. Uh, so you only put down so much because, again, you don't know what the end results are going to be. But it turned out really well. We've um, we've we've been having a lot of fun with it in the market, and uh, we'll continue to kind of build on that in the, in the years ahead, and along with a lot of other programs that are kind of in house. So with this, I'm always curious: Are you using your base blend here, then then going in to barrels? We are. So on our Honig and our Chimney Rock, we actually use our Brush Creek uh, blended straight bourbon whiskeys. And uh, the proof is a little bit higher uh, on those. So 97.4 on the Honig, 97 on the Chimney Rock. Um, actually on the Carboy, the Carboy is a, uh, a Cab Franc finish. Mm. Um, and the Cab Franc finish, we used uh, two six-year-old uh, straight bourbon whiskeys out of Southern Indiana. Mm. Uh, they were a high rye, and we've thought that those matched really well with that uh, Cab Franc kind of finish. Mm. And so um, I think it, it's got a lot of pyrazines in there. And it's just, it's, it's a, again, it's just one more way to showcase a, a unique program. Yeah. So what, what I, what I like about the Honig is you get the upfront of the straight bourbon you get that cinnamon, spice, sugar, yeah. spice, and then the back is all the plum, like dark stone fruit type notes that show up that you're used to in a in a cab, like and so it's bold and and fruity and luscious and it also like salivating on the palate. I was gonna say it doesn't dry your mouth out like no. like I've had some red wine finished whiskeys and that just zaps all the all the 
you know, salivary glands just dry up. This doesn't do that. It actually works kind of the opposite. It, it brightens it up. Mm-hmm. Kind of funny enough. I think, you know, it's, it's unfortunately it's because of price points and things like that. It's, it's not one where it's a, um, beginners, you know, entry into the, the bourbon world, but it, it kind of rounds off some of the, uh, um, some of the bourbon notes, you know, yeah. just makes it uh, a little more elegant. And mm. I think people who aren't necessarily bourbon drinkers are like, wow, this is really great. You know, you're like, well, you picked up a, a higher price, you know, kind of entry point, but, um, but they're great. And I think they offer a lot of unique just expressions on their own. So speaking while we're talking about price, so the straight rye and the straight bourbon are yeah, so what? our uh, our rye is about a forty seven ninety nine uh, kind of retail. Uh, our bourbon is about a fifty seven ninety nine retail. Our railroad rye was one twenty nine yeah. ninety nine, uh, and then our honig was about one twenty four ninety nine. Okay, which which you know right? Like you think about it, if you look at Barstown Bourbon Company as being like the kind of like the north star, yeah, on finished whiskeys right now, which I, I think that's kind of like they did a great job with that. Uh, Pfeiffer Pavit, uh, yeah, cab mm. that they did, you yeah. know, initially out of the gates, yeah, and so they're one fifty nine ninety nine. So you're you're within the realm of possibility putting a six year, and then people don't realize wine barrels are not cheap. Let's just throw that one out there <laughs> and do you know, it for nine I'll, months. Yeah, and I'll say there's nothing cheap about uh, leasing a railroad car and shipping it down the path of Transcontinental Railroad. Either. Yeah, <laughs> that was one of those things where you pitch this to a group of investors and they look at you like, that's the craziest thing I think I've ever heard. We should do it. And you're like, all right, great. <laughs> you know, it's, there was nothing cheap about that uh, between transportation uh, across multiple points and the rail and uh, petitions and everything else that happened. But um, I think it, it has the basis for some great things to come. And that's, that's a big part of where we are with it. Yeah. No, I've had a lot of fun so far. Um, so I'm going to end with this. We we originally said we were not going to get there, but we're getting there. Um, your barrel program. Yeah. Yeah. So you have these three little, you know, hundred mils over here. I can't really see them. They, they all, they look like a, a special surprise, even for me at the house in the office, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you know, what you said, I think rang true before the podcast is you have Kentucky, Indiana, and Tennessee. And it's like, Eh, you could give me a 15 year old Kentucky and that'd be a hell of a single barrel or a 15 year old Tennessee and it'd be a hell of a single barrel or Indiana, but like being able to do something a little bit different. So what are you doing? That's a little bit different to engage the, the consumer to look at these single barrels. Well, I could say that the, uh, our barrel program, we, we've gone back and forth on it. The, the easiest thing to do would be to just say it's a single barrel. And we put it out there. Um, it's not necessarily our single barrel, but it's a single barrel. And it's that kind of unique snowflake that everybody uh, is kind of looking for. But um, having been in the distributor background and, and trying to build a brand where you actually want to uh, really touch everything that gets into the hands of hands and mouths of folks out there, we looked at it a little bit differently. So we call it our um, Elevated Barrel Select Program. And what we do is we do our proprietary blend of bourbon or rye. Uh, we'll do uh, a, a blend, a, a small barrel blend, and then we'll recask them. And then we'll continue to age them on site uh, in Wyoming. So it's a, it's a double cask program uh, with elevated proofs. So it's, it's really a, a barrel proof uh, option and uh, it's a double cask. And so you know, we've we've sampled these throughout the process to kind of find out where is that maturation. To, you know, what's the best expression? Is it coming mm. out in in a spring or a fall or a summer? And all the things we have to kind of think about in the maturation of a high elevation, you know, distillery. And so we're coming up with some fun stuff. Yeah. Um, our our bourbon is about 115 proof, and our rye is about 116 proof. And uh, we feel like those are where they kind of fall out best. So when you say doubles cask, do you mean two casks going into a very small blend like Lux Co's 12-year double cask? Or what do you mean by double cask? Yeah. So like we'll take, uh, like our rye, for instance, we'll do a six-barrel blend. Uh, We'll blend it and then we'll re-barrel it back into those original casks. Okay. Uh, So the age statement, you know, once you do that, really stops. Yep. Um, But it's more about kind of putting it back into the wood and and giving it an opportunity to, to really just 
get a little bit of a, a more maturation in the barrel uh, based off the blend that you created. Okay. I like that. That's an interesting approach because you, you make one blend and then you got six different, you know, to see what those, how those all shake out. Because the cask can be a little bit different. It's kind of like a, a mini Solera if you kept those barrels around. Yeah. And then we also do some things where we keep them in different areas of the property. So what we didn't touch on, there's a, you know, part of the ranch out there, they have a, a Wagyu program. Mm. Um, the Wagyu program, originally there were four uh, cattle barns that were built uh, that later didn't go into use for the cattle program. So we now have uh, barrel barns that we use. Um, <laughs> if we filled up each one of these barrel barns, we could probably put about 80,000 barrels on property. We're, a long way from getting there. <laughs> but that being said, uh, we keep some of the barrels uh, in the distillery. We keep some of the barrels in the barrel barns. And so we kind of look at the just the temperature variation and what's happening with the mm-hmm. outcomes. And, and then we give people a chance to decide for themselves. You mm-hmm. know, So if you say, hey, I'm interested in you know your bourbon or your rye, we'll th- send you three samples, three different barrels. And uh, what you don't know is where those barrels were actually laid down. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Speaking of that, we're doing some pretty fun things on hiding barrels out in the middle of a 30,000 acre ranch. So when you guys come to make it, we'll probably throw you on the back of a razor and uh, zip off into the, the countryside and you get a chance to try uh, some elevated whiskeys at a, mm. yeah. It's like a little, little scavenger hunt. Pull my leg. <laughs> it out. I can hunt down whiskey. Uh, trust me. <laughs> I think, I, can, I think we're in the right area. I, yeah. we're, we're close. I can, I can smell, I can smell wood that, that's <laughs> got whiskey in it. So the question is, may we try any of those? Yeah, without a doubt. You tell me what you want to try. So if you want to try the bourbon, the rye, uh, that was the honig. So let's try the bourbon. Okay. So again, what we've got here is, uh, it's 116 proof. Uh, this was a blend of four to 13 year old when we put it in. That is, uh, three mash pills. We talked about four grains and, um, I'll let you uh, take the wheel on your thoughts. There's a lot of thoughts I can have, so don't let me take the wheel. I can tell you tell you right now, like, love the nose. I, I, I've really enjoyed the nose in all of these, to be honest. Like, I, I think the team that's blending this, because I'm sure, like, your master blender or your master distiller is doing a lot of the blending, but it's got to go through a sensory panel, and we skip that because we know that's happening. But, like, the nose on these have... I always get I always get a little leery about noses because sometimes when you're blending three, the astringency, astringency, that's a hard word for me. <clears throat> like cause it just makes my mouth all funky. But the astringency of of blending can be really difficult and it can just be off putting. The noses on these have been on putting to me, which which is good. So the nose on the on the double barrel starts off very on putting. So one of the things I probably didn't touch on enough, and I won't go too far uh, down that rabbit hole, but um, our team, I like, I can't say enough uh, great things about them. I mean, when, you know, Philip, who's got a background with strain of hands, uh, we brought another gentleman out from Kentucky that was with a, uh, a story program here and I have a lot of respect for his background. Um, I mean, you know, even, even the gentleman who's just in the trenches learning is a Penn State grad who we call him Big Tree. The guy will go up, pick up like a half barrel of whiskey and carry it across the parking lot, drop it somewhere and tell you thank you. I mean, it's that kind of a team <laughs> in a remote location. Our front of the house uh, hospitality director is a level three sum. And um, it's just, it goes on and on. And so when you sit down with this group of individuals and some of the folks we've had on board in the past that, uh, again, brewery backgrounds, and, and we bring in sums from, you know, on property that, um, we're overseeing that 30,000 bottle wine collection and really get, you don't want to get group think, right? Everybody thinks it's the best stuff in the world because it's your stuff. Mm-hmm. So we bring people in or like, Hey, pick at it. Tell us what we don't know. And you know, there's a lot of professionals on site there that they're honest. And so we really kind of evaluate it. And, you know, uh, we actually, you know, we just want the best whiskey to, to be brought forward, but it, it does make for a good experience. It's like graham cracker. Is like the kind of like the first note that I'm getting. And then it, it's so nutmeg, clove, not necessarily clove, but nutmeg, cinnamon, like that. That's kind of like the, like it's the pumpkin pie spices without pumpkin pie. It's, 
it's super rye heavy to me. Yeah. Like the rye heavy bourbon, like less the less of the corn sweetness, more of the just punchy what I bourbon feel, notes. You're not wrong. I'd feel that this is an Indiana, Tennessee main part of the blend with just a dead bit of Kentucky. Just a splash. Just a splash. Because the the so Indiana really known for high rye content mm. from a whiskey or bourbon perspective. But like there's that undernote of like a little bit of charcoal mellowing that like I'm just getting on the back end that gives it viscosity and the sweetness to to balance out that high rye. But the graham cracker like sprinkled with cinnamon sugar kind of like note is is I, I like that. And then there's obviously some some bit of citrus, um, but the nutmeg cinnamon note is kind of what like is lingering on my palate. Cinnamon toast crunch. Yes. Yeah. If you put a little bit of orange juice in it versus <laughs> unless milk. you grab the wrong jug out of the fridge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been a long night. Yeah, it's it's been a long <laughs> night. It's it's that was the night that you had fourth meal and then you were like, I need another meal. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No. But it, and and the proof point's nice too. The like the elevated proof point, even though like at ninety four, it doesn't. It's not like a. It's not a thin whiskey. No. But even at one hundred and fourteen, one hundred and fourteen, one hundred and fifteen. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's it's punchy, which is, is. nice. It, but it's not over punchy. You know what it kind of reminds me of? Hmm. Our Ezra Brooks pick. It does. I agree. And. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you, you never, you never know where whiskey's purchased from. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I like that. And I like that. It's I like it's different, right? It's not just a barrel, right? Cause you probably have a hell of a cream of a crop barrels that you could have just thrown at us. Yeah. I like that you're doing something a little bit different. Yeah, we actually, uh, when, when we started out, we had uh, a master blender here in uh, Kentucky come through and do a, a kind of a profiling and analysis on all of our barrels initially. And um, we really kind of just started to set those aside as to which projects we wanted them to go into. And, uh, of course, that was, you know, two and a half years ago or whatnot, uh, three years ago. And so that that obviously changes over yeah. time with the maturation and everything else but i think it really it, it led us down the right path and you know it, again it wasn't just us you know it was bringing the outsiders bring in other influences that um yeah that that we don't just get this group think mentality as to what we're doing and um yeah we're we're really open to uh, as we jokingly said, it's a little bit of Willy Wonk and the chocolate factory out there. And I could probably put five more bottles on this table that we produce mm-hmm. that um, no one's aware of. I mean, we've got products that are red, white, and blue um, mash bills for uh, a hero's edition. We've got bottles that are, uh, we've got one right now that's on a Takashi barrel. We've got a cognac. We've got, it's, we, we have rye aging on extra Añejo tequila barrels. We've got our gin, which uh, a big piece of that is the 20,000 square foot warehouse that's, uh, excuse me, greenhouse that's on site. They grow some of our botanicals and locally foraged juniper on site. We make our gin, put it in a freshly dumped uh, rye barrel, and then age it in the greenhouse on site. So it's like, what else can we do to push hmm. the limits to have some fun? And um, yeah, we're up for anything. Are those gaining? Are those gaining or losing proof? Uh, well, the funny, the interesting part about our elevation out there is that it's such an arid environment that we are actually uh, losing some of our uh, the water evaporation, but we're mm. gaining some of our proof. Gaining proof. And so, yeah, it's um, high proof barrel aged gin. Sign me up. I have it, <laughs> and it's it's a new American style gin. So it's one of those things where. I wish I, I have to get you a bottle of gin. No, I have You say that. I almost brought one. And I was like, ah, it's it's not that focused. But for us, when you whiteboard something before you ever go to market and you think, all right, what's what's the percentage of business going to look like? And our gin is taken on a, a whole new level. And it's because, I mean, we're not a complete like farm to table, seed to table on that side of things. But when all of a sudden your chamomile and your coriander and your juniper, uh, juniper are coming off property and your snowmelt water is captured on site, as far as it, it makes for damn good product. And all of a sudden, um, people that 
that new American style. People were so used to that traditional, you know, um, beef eaters or beef whatever. E- yeah. And, um, that all of a sudden they're like, I don't like gin. They're like, maybe I do like gin, <laughs> you know, whatever. And you combine that in a great cocktail and it's a, it's a game changer. Yeah. Now I, I've been super impressed by the, the profile tonight and we haven't even opened up a couple of these other ones and I'm kind of bummed that we haven't, but <laughs> you know, we only have so many, so much time, um, um, so I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, Andrew, where can people find out more about Brush Creek? Yeah, really, um, uh, brushcreekdistory.com. Uh, we're actually just rolling out a new website, our, our Instagram at Brush Creek Distillery, our Facebook at Brush Creek Distillery, um, and, and really just a, a lot of the podcasts and different things that we're doing. Uh, we're, we're really on the infancy of things in terms of like getting out there and promoting uh, our product. Uh, a lot of time has been spent really just in the trenches in the market, yeah. just getting product into distribution, probably not as much of a focus on the marketing as it should be. <laughs> so, so thank you. At, thank you guys. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a big part of what I thought I would be doing, you know, when we launched a brand and then you realize it's just a lot of in the trenches, mm-hmm. making it happen, uh, getting it, you know, um, into, in distribution. And, um, again, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Kentucky, and uh, we just kind of scratched the surface on Indiana, mm-hmm. and uh, we're looking forward to a slow build, but we're not in any big rush to see mm-hmm. how many states we can get into. We want to do it right and try to be in the market supporting product, uh, our, our partners, and yeah, and building the brand. Yeah. No, I think this has been great, and we, we truly appreciate the opportunity to talk about the whiskeys. It's been a long time coming. I've literally kept the seals on these whiskeys <laughs> up until tonight, so um, it's been been fun. Can't wait to try the Cabernet, Cabernet Franc because that's my favorite wine. I'm so excited to see something finished in in that for sure. So as always, thanks everybody for listening to this episode of The Bourbon Lens. Again, you can find out more about us at bourbonlens.com. Or go over to our Instagrams, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Bourbon Lens. Last but not least, would you please go over to your favorite podcast listening app, give us a five-star review, and give us a comment. Scott and I would truly appreciate it. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.